Hello everyone, welcome to our Egyptian online seminar group. Uh, first, keep your phones off, and then if you have any questions, you can ask our speaker during his presentation. I have great pleasure of welcoming dear Professor DJ Nanda. Uh, DJ Nanda is uh, a vice dean of uh, faculty and research and professor of accounting at uh, uh, Miami, 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 Miami University, University of Miami, Mina Herbert Business School. Uh, his research has been published in top ranking journals such as uh, Journal of Accounting and Economics, Journal of Accounting Research, the Accounting Review, the Journal of Financial uh, Economics, the, uh, the Review of Accounting Studies, and the Journal of uh, Operations Management. Uh, Nanda won several research and uh, teaching awards, and his work has been recognized internationally. Now we will start our seminar with dear uh, Professor DJ Nanda. Thanks, Mohammed. Thanks for the introduction. It's my pleasure to do this. Uh, you know, anytime I kind of think of academics or researchers as musicians. So when somebody gives you a stage, you know, you want to perform for them. So uh, I'm here. I'm going to share a couple uh, new working papers of mine in this literature on executive turnover, which I have uh, participated in for the last uh, two decades almost. So uh, just rules of the road, if anybody has any questions, please free to raise your hand or unmute yourself and ask questions as we go along. Um, so, you know, when I think about executive turnover and research, we need a framework to kind of think of it. And a lot of what I have experienced in my life has been driven by you know, this idea that, yeah, you know, we need models and all models are wrong, but some are useful. This goes back to George Box. He's a statistician, he was a statistician in the UK, uh, but it applies to sort of not just analytical models, but also empirical models that we, you know, we think that they are, they have to be true, but then they, they are wrong, but they can be useful. So what's the model that has sort of changed the way I kind of think about things? And this has, sort of transformed my scholarly activity, but also ha has helped me understand um, other research that I read, whether it's outside my area or within my area. The model is actually pretty simple. It's Bayes rule, right? So virtually everything we do in information economics is based on this Bayes rule. It's the bedrock principle of all information economics. Very simply, it's saying, you know, we have some prior, uh, you know, the likelihood of something happening is what we consider prior. Then we get some evidence, uh, something else happens, and we revise our prior to a posterior using a likelihood function. So for a lot of people in sort of empirical archival work, this is essentially your regression equation, right? So your regression, your likelihood ratio is your coefficient on your variable of interest. Uh, PA is... Uh, and TV are your prior and your evidence, right? So why is this useful? Well, this, this is the bedrock principle to understand executive turnover, okay? Because over time, as information comes about, we change our view about what somebody is, how good they are, or uh, should we replace them? So without getting into the mathematics, this is basically what Bayes' rule looks like you have this uh, light shaded line on blue line on prior beliefs. I get this light green line on evidence and the evidence turns out to be on the right side of my prior beliefs. So my posterior beliefs move to the right. And the second thing that happens is my posterior beliefs have lower variance than my prior beliefs because now I have more information. So when I have more information, there's less uncertainty uh, about my prior. So this is basically all the math that I'm going to share with you. And then I'm going to talk about two papers. So how do we think of scholarship in turnover? Um, so people have looked at, asked the question, why do managers get fired or removed or replaced, right? So that's the first idea in executive turnover. Uh, what's the next idea? The next idea is performance. Uh, does performance affect turnover? Uh, if so, how much? If not, why not, right? So this is the other question. Do some people argue that uh, we don't have enough executive or managerial turnover? Um, 
And then how does this affect the governance of an enterprise? Uh, are the boards of directors doing the job correctly? So that's one idea. And the last idea in turnover scholarship, what are the consequences? How does turnover affect firm performance? How does uh, turnover affect choices firms make regarding disclosure policy, accounting, recognition, all these factors are consequences. So roughly, these are these three big ideas in executive turnover. So how do we think about this? Well, we always think of directors, boards, as representing owners. Uh, and so this goes back to the Berlin mean separation of ownership and control. And what, what do the directors do? They hire a CEO uh, or a CFO or any other senior executive. They monitor this executive. Uh, and if they want to replace this executive, they will replace after seeing what they've done, right? But how you monitor affects who you wish to hire. And so this is the subtlety over here. So it's not just simply monitoring any randomly chosen person. If I'm going to spend a lot of time monitoring, it affects who I will hire. And so I'm going to share a little framework to think about this. Okay, so this is the distribution of ability um, of an executive. Okay, let's look at expected ability, which is basically the mean of this distribution. And the incumbent or the current CEO or executive is expected to have ability higher than any potential replacement, which is your pink replacement, right? So this is. This is the starting framework that the current manager is better than my next best alternative or opportunity cost. Okay, so if I don't get any new information, I will always keep the original CEO because the distribution is not going to change. So this is where accounting comes in and the role of information in how we think about executive turnover. So if I get a good signal of performance, just like I showed you with Bayes' rule, my distribution is going to move to the right. And if it moves to the right, I'm more likely to keep the incumbent because now the posterior expected ability exceeds that of my prior expected ability and the replacement, uh, my next best replacement's ability. If I get a bad signal, this distribution is going to also shift to the left and if it falls, the expected ability in my posterior falls below the replacement, expected ability of a replacement, we're going to replace the incumbent, right? So this is a simple framework. But there's a second thing if you notice. After both signals, the variance of my posterior ability is smaller. So the distribution is also shrinking. So there's a mean effect, but there's also a variance effect. So both things are important when we sort of take this to the empirics to try to understand how should we think about executive turnover, okay? Now, so the benefit of monitoring is simply that we get to get rid of low ability CEOs, those who fall to the left of the distribution, and we retain high ability CEOs who fall to the right of the distribution, okay? Now, now going back to who gets monitored. Now, if I have two CEOs, I, both with the same variance, but different mean expected ability, the red CEO will be monitored more intensely because there's more value, because there's more mass to the left of the replacement ability CEO. The green CEO has less mass to the left of the, so I don't really care about monitoring a green CEO. So what implication does this have? That if I believe the CEO is really good, I'm not going to monitor as intensely. If I think the CEO is not as good, I'm going to monitor intensely. So now you see empirically this creates a problem because people would say, oh, you know, governance is inversely related to performance. Well, that's because governance is a function of performance. If I have a high performing CEO, I don't need to invest as much in monitoring, right? So, so this is the subtlety in this research. Now, as far as the variances are concerned, there's more value to monitoring a CEO whose ability is more uncertain 
But again, again, because the mass of the probability distribution to the left of the replacement is higher. So if I have greater uncertainty about how a CEO does, there'll be more active monitoring. So if you think of firms that are starting up, there's more uncertainty about firm value. We should see more monitoring there than firms that have already established themselves. There's less uncertainty about their performance. Okay. So then the question is, how does this affect whether I have external hires or internal hires? The maintained assumption over here is if it's an internal candidate, we have a little more information about them because they've been at the firm longer. So there's less uncertainty, which means we don't want to monitor internal hires as intensely as we do external hires who have a higher uncertainty in their ability, right? So again, monitoring means avoiding bad things. Monitoring means maintaining or keeping good things. So uh, the first project I'm gonna talk about today is a joint project uh, with Miguel Minuti Meza at Miami Herbert and Rosie Shu, who's at CUHK. Uh, she was a PhD student who graduated uh, a year ago from our program. It's called Big Shoes to Fill. The idea is, does performance that precedes the arrival of a CEO affect their likelihood of replacement? Okay, and so anecdotally, people say a CEO is more likely to be dismissed for underperformance when appointed at a better performing firm. And the reason is because, and some people say, call this the big shoes to fill effect. And so the media is replete with this, right? So when Iger stepped down uh, and Bob Chapek took over Disney, this was the Fortune headline, Disney's new CEO, Bob Chapek has big shoes to fill. When tip, Tim Cook replaced Steve Jobs, the same. Tim Cook has big shoes to fill. Lord, when Lord, uh, Lloyd Blankfein uh, stepped down, the headline was successor will have big shoes to fill, right? So what is this big shoes to fill? I think people casually say, oh, you're just following a really good CEO, but it's not really a good CEO. We argue that it's, you are being appointed at a really good firm, okay? The old CEO is gone. The old CEO doesn't really matter anymore. It's what they left behind, which is the value of assets at that firm, which persist over time. And so how do we think of this? Very simply, we take the Hermelin and Weisbach framework, which is value of firm performance is a function of managerial ability and some error term, but we add to it something about a firm's asset quality, which is time, which persists over time. So it's time invariant, and that's the F. So what past performance does is, past performance tells me something about F. So even if I replace the CEO, the F is still there. And so I'm using past performance to learn more about the firm. So a bunch of math, it's not very important. The whole idea is we, replace a CEO if their performance falls below expectation, but the expectation is affected by prior firm performance. So if I follow a high performing CEO, the owners expect high performance in the future. So a new CEO is being judged on a much higher bar. And that's your expected value of VT given VT minus one. And so as VT minus one goes up, your expectation of VT goes up. And so a new CEO is more likely to be fired if they are appointed at a better performing firm, okay? So uh, the very simple prediction is that turnover performance sensitivity increases in pre-appointment firm performance. Now, people hadn't talked about this. This is sort of a dynamic uh, empirical exercise. Um, and so we, you know, typically when we talk about uh, evaluating CEOs, we use relative performance evaluation. And the relative performance evaluation typically in the literature is contemporaneous performance of peer CEOs. But it's not, what we are arguing is, it's not just the contemporary peers, but it's also your past, your predecessor, who affects your likelihood of dismissal. So the second implication is when there's greater uncertainty about a firm's fundamental, the F, 
pre-appointment firm performance is even more important. And that's because of that shrinkage in the distribution that I showed you earlier, that anytime I observe something, the posterior variance declines. And when I start off with a very high variance, the information gives me more information about my posterior, okay? So now some people argue that there are some alternative explanation that it's not really firm performance that you care about. You care about how this person compares with the individual that they succeed, not really the firm. Uh, the second argument is because corporate governance is endogenous, maybe some of this effect is being different by corporate governance. So the idea is if you are a high performing firm, uh, you probably have better governance. That's why you're a high performing firm. And then because you have better governance, a CEO is more likely to be dismissed. So we, we're gonna explore both these ideas uh, to the best that we can empirically. Okay, so what do we do? We can we gather a bunch of data on S and P 500 firms from '93 to 2017. So we have a very long time series of information. Um, so you know, in essence, we have about 80,000 observations. We have about 1,400 turnover observations in this data set. Um, so the big issue is how do you measure performance? So for the current CEO we use uh, the cumulative returns during four quarters ending in each year. Uh, why do we use cumulative four quarter returns? So I had my previous work with Shane DeColi and Bill Mayu. What we showed was, even if you look at performance quarterly, the four quarter performance, after the four quarter performance, the fifth and sixth don't really matter that much. But turnover is really the most powerful measure of turnover is four quarter performance. Now we also do a bunch of other, uh, include other performance measures, ROA, we do industry adjustment, uh, different weights on industry portfolio. We also do a market model and take only the idiosyncratic component of the return rather than this and exclude the systematic. Uh, so there are a whole bunch of robustness tests, which I'm not really gonna go through. They don't really affect uh, conclusion. Now, what about the pre-appointment performance? Because now the old CEO is gone. So how do we evaluate their performance? So what we look at, one measure is the idiosyncratic returns in the four quarters preceding a CEO's appointment. So this was before they joined. Um, we also do, we look at the previous CEO's entire cumulative performance over their entire tenure. We also look at the previous CEO's tenure so under the assumption that longer tenure reflects better performance, right? So if you succeed somebody who'd been there a long time, uh, you're more likely at a better performing firm. And the model specification is very simple. We do hazard rate models and logit uh, uh, estimation. And our focus is <clears throat> on beta three, which is the coefficient on the interaction term between the current CEO's performance and the past performance of the firm. Okay, so that's very simple. And then we have a bunch of covariates that we include, including fixed effects and stuff. So the whole idea is beta three should be negative. Negative means increased sensitivity because this is a turnover regression. So if negative performance causes turnover, more negative coefficient implies a greater sensitivity to turn over. So remember this, so negative means more. It's kind of a weird thing, but in the executive turnover literature, that's sort of how we think of uh, the coefficient. So uh, we split positive performance and negative performance in our regression, because the idea is that if it's forced turnover, it should be preceded by negative performance, not by positive performance. And sure enough, just as in the past literature, we get a negative coefficient on negative performance. When we interact it with past performance, it's only heightened for negative performance. So if you look, the coefficient gets a negative and significant on the interaction term between negative performance and past performance, which implies that if you are appointed at a better performing firm, you're more likely to be dismissed for the same level of performance as a counterpart who's appointed at a 
less better performing firm. Okay, so this is basically the big shoes to fill. Perfect. We do a logit model, we get exactly the same results. Uh, so turnover performance sensitivity gets heightened if uh, and increases in past performance. Now these are regressions. What do the economic effects look like? And this is what I, instead of regressions, this is what I wanna look at because Bayes rule is pretty simple, right? Bayes rule actually implies monotonicity, which means it's not enough to just on average show a negative effect that negative effect should decline monotonically over my covariate of interest, in this case, past performance. And sure enough, we find that, that the marginal sensitivity of performance on performance turnover sensitivity monotonically declines from, or I should say increases, because this is negatives, from the 10th percentile to the 90th percentile. Um, so it goes from minus 0.18 to minus 0.56, but in each, each percentile, the decline is monotonic. So that means this is really consistent with an application of Bayes rule, where we should see uncertainty resolution behaving monotonically, okay? Um, the second idea was, what about firm uncertainty? So if you go to a firm, which is, there's more uncertainty in their performance, how does past performance affect the turnover performance sensitivity? And we find, in, again, results consistent with Bayes rule. When there's more uncertainty measured as either idiosyncratic volatility, firm size, firm age, or forecast dispersion by analysts, we find that the role of past performance heightens turnover performance sensitivity. So, if you look at low, high, low, high, low, high, when uncertainty is low, past performance is less, but when uncertainty is high, past performance plays a much bigger role in effect internal. Uh, now, does this, how does this affect internal performance sensitivity over the CEO's tenure? We're talking about the current CEO's tenure. Again, Bayes, Bayes rule implies that this should monotonically decline. Because as we gather more and more information about a current CEO, the old information is less useful. And sure enough, we show that in the first year, it's the highest, minus 0.77. After two years, it's minus 0.64, then goes to minus 0.46. And by the fourth year, it's not even significant anymore. So again, it's consistent with sort of Bayes rule and a monotonic convex decline in the sensitivity of uh, turnover to performance, okay? So I had mentioned before that, is this really because of the characteristic of the CEO, uh, the contrast effect, which is, is this sort of an irrational story? And we find no evidence of it. So for instance, whether it's an outsider CEO, insider CEO, it's an old CEO, new CEO, whether the CEO has prior experience or does not, we find the same result that there's past performance. It's not the CEO's type, it's the old CEO's departure and performance during their tenure that actually affects, uh, uh, which is part of the big shoes to fill effect. Um, finally, we look at whether governance quality matters. So we have these four measures, of uh, three measures of governance that the literature has used before, which is independence of the board, the size of the board, whether a board is busy, and also whether or not the CEO chair uh, is split or is held by the same person, also known as CA CEO chair duality. We find uh, our results are robust to inclusion of all these covariates, they don't really affect the main result, which is the negative coefficient on the interaction term between performance and past performance, okay? Um, does it matter how the previous CEO departed, whether it was forced or uh, non-performance induced? It doesn't matter. So this is, it's all about who, how the firm did before you joined, rather than who, why the CEO your predecessor left. It doesn't really matter, okay? 
So again, a very parsimonious framework using Bayes rules, we find evidence consistent, empirical evidence consistent with their predictions that a CEO performance appears to be evaluated relative to uh, their firm's performance prior to their appointment. So it's like an RP relative performance evaluation over time. Um, and consequently an underperforming CEO is more likely to be dismissed if they take a job at a high performing firm, okay? So there's job insecurity when you walk, greater job insecurity being appointed at a good firm than a bad firm, which seems sort of counterintuitive to how commonly people talk about things, right? Okay, let me stop here and open it up for questions before I move on to the next paper. If you don't have any questions, you can open your mic and uh, ask your question. Okay, I guess I don't have any questions. Okay, I, so let me. Yeah, I, I can interrupt here a little bit. Uh, uh, so thanks for the presentation. So far, I'm uh, I'm trying to wrap my head around the the, the findings that you have done in your uh, uh, paper, and I was. So there are two things here. Uh, the, the the first one is. You discussed that the performance is basically the uh, main motive for turnover, which is understandable. And uh, in um, specific, you suggested that it's only the four quarters um, preceding the turnover decision is actually the ones that affect that decision mostly, mm -hmm. which is understandable. I think there's a paper I wrote, I, I uh, read before talking about that usually CEOs uh, tend to be um asked to leave the firm when we have an industry shock because the board usually try to um you know leave the, the push the ceo out of the firm if they feel like the performance is not really well so two things here i want to ask about uh, your proposed idea that the performance is made is basically driven everything uh, how the board exactly can fit into that picture in terms of the composition of the board to be an active monitor compared to a person who is just passive and attending these? Do, have you looked at that? Did, do, you, do you have any suggestion of how we can think about the role of the board in terms of that's not that just an indust industry shock, it's basically uh, also how the board perceived the performance of the managers themselves. Yes, so uh, so le let me interject very quickly. So, you know, executives are replaced for a myriad of reasons. You know, it could be health, it could be retirement, it could be an acquisition. So there could be lots of reasons. For us, we are only interested in sort of performance-induced turnover, right? And And the reason is because Bayes rule only tells me about how I revise my beliefs in light of new information that comes in. Now, how does we assume like this board is sitting there and looking at this information periodically and updating their priors, right? So that's the maintained assumption. So empirically, we find evidence consistent with that. Does that mean they all do that? No, I don't think so. I think, yes, there's a you know, out of these 80,000 observations, I mean, we have a whole spectrum of the activity by directors. Some of them are very diligent, active monitors. Some of them are not, they are well firm. We can only say something on average that we observe. So on average, it seems like we do see CEOs getting fired for bad performance. Now, and it could be more than four quarters. So we do a bunch of robustness tests. Um, but empirically, it's, it seems very, very robust that if I capture four quarters, uh, it's, it's a very good measure of performance for a CEO. And I think empirically, it's challenging to go longer than that, partly because the average tenure of a CEO is about four and a half years. Uh, you know, and
and the first quartile is two years. So you lose a lot of observations as, as we lengthen the performance window, we start seeing a lot of observations dropping out. So empirically for a data reason, we sort of constrain it to four quarters, but you can go longer. Uh, as far as boards are concerned, so typically people argue that we need some measure of governance quality related to how diligent a board is. And the best so far we have is what is called the busy board. How often does the board meet? And the literature has sort of used that. Now, is it satisfactory? Probably not. Is it a measure correlated with how active directors are? Most likely, yes. But we don't really have really good measures of how good directors are at their job. It's unfortunate. You know, we have very good measures of how CEOs are. CEOs actually get evaluated annually. And that is disclosed. But I don't know of a single firm that evaluates its directors annually. And if it is, it is never disclosed. No, no company discloses that, you know, this director missed. They may say, okay, they only attended so many meetings, but they're not going to say that this person doesn't do their homework, comes in and does, you know, is there just to fill a board seat. So a long answer to your question. I think it's, uh, you know, posing more questions than answers, which is really helpful. I think that that's why we do research. Right. But I just want to jump in and, and add one more comment here. The, the other part that I'm personally interested in is, is how the risk of the executive impact that decision, uh, either positively or negatively, because as you, su you know, suggested that, yes, a CEO are evaluated and they got most of the attention and the research, but the rest of the management team is basically mostly silent or they are taken as a package, but we do not look at that distinction between a role of the CEO who manage everybody else compared to the people who support that management or either contribute to its success or not. Yeah, uh, it's a, it's, and I think again, it's driven by sort of data availability. I think we just have a lot richer data on CEOs. Like every company has a CEO, not every company has a chief marketing officer in the top five paid executives, you know? Okay, every company may have a CFO, but the CFO's tenure is, the median tenure for a CFO is 2.3 years. So CFO is just a stepping stone to going, becoming a CEO, <laughs> looks like. So it's a data problem, but I wish, yes, we had better data on other executives. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I joined your uh, talk a little bit lately, but um, I still have a question regarding the, your conclusions because you said basically um, that um, firms, uh, that the CEOs get fired or dismissed. And I was wondering whether you can really conclude that they get dismissed or fired because they could maybe also decide by their own to leave the firm. Yes. For example, they are unable to implement their visions, uh, their mm -hmm. personal issues or whatever. So, right. yeah. Yes, absolutely. And like I said, there are myriad reasons why CEOs uh, turn over. Uh, exactly. So what we try to do is empirically let the data speak. So yes. the fact that we find a very strong relation between performance and turnover suggests that indeed CEOs are dismissed for poor performance among other reasons. So, you know, do we really know the full story? In fact, there's a, I think Dave Locker and Brian Tyon have a recent working paper on this where they actually did a deep dive into why CEOs are dismissed. And they find that performance is actually a very, very important reason. And oftentimes, even when the excuse given is for health or retirement, it's performance that caused the dismissal. Yeah, could be one reason. Yeah, but but fine. And um, I was just not uh, sure about, or I wasn't really convinced with you on your on your last with your last slide. But um, anyway, yeah, I see. Thanks. So I mean, yeah, our interest is only performance induced turnover because that's all Bayes' rule can speak to, right? Because absolutely, 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I we don't have, think Bain can tell me anything about the health <laughs> and yeah. well-being of, of a CEO. But yeah. Thanks. Sure. Okay, so the next uh, paper I want to uh, briefly uh, discuss is this uh, another paper that I have with my colleagues here at Miami, Daniele Machoki, um, who's an assistant professor of accounting, and Ini Wang. She's a current PhD student and hopes to be on the job market next year. And so what we did was, you know, there's a lot of literature, and it's sort of old and dated on family firms. And there are two views of family firms. One view of family firms is they are inefficient because the controlling family is using it as their pet project and there's no market for corporate control that can discipline them. The other view is that the family firm is better governed than the non-family firm because the family has a legacy incentive to maintain the long run health of the family to keep uh, the firm to keep it in the family, right? So there's this literature on is the governance of family firms better or worse than non-family firms? So what we did was we explored this question, does family ownership and legacy incentives affect the sensitivity of turnover to accounting and market performance? Again, the framework is Bayes rule. The idea is periodically we have accounting performance and the market anticipates future performance. And the question is, do these performance measures affect the likelihood of turnover in family and non-family firms? Why? Because if indeed family firms are poorly governed, then we should see less sensitivity of turnover to performance than in non-family firms, right? And so turnover is, we are using turnover performance sensitivity as a measure of governance in these firms, how good are they? Okay, so what do we do? We look at the variation in the relative weight placed on accounting and stock returns uh, in CEO turnover uh, de uh, decisions. We look at family firms, we look at variation in family ownership concentration. So within family firms, does ownership concentration affect this? Uh, we look at the family owner's legacy incentives, and I'll come back to explaining how we measure legacy incentives. We do it two ways. Okay, so what is family ownership? Family ownership is everywhere. You know, much as we like to talk about public corporations, publicly traded corporations, family firms are everywhere, including in publicly corporations. So Fachu and Lang have this data uh, in Europe, East Asia, family firms dominate the private sector. Uh, and this, I'm talking about public, publicly traded uh, firms. Even in the US, and people don't realize this, 35% of large and over, over half of all public firms are family controlled. Think about Facebook. Zuckerberg with dual class stock controls Facebook. The three founding owners of Google controlled uh, Google. Uh, Johnson & Johnson is still a family business. Ford Motor Company is family controlled. And so even though we treat them as public corporations because they have a lot of non-family shareholders, it's ubiquitous. Um, the second idea is the ownership concentration by a family affects the informativeness of earnings and stock return. Why? Some people have argued Accounting earnings will be less informative where there's high family ownership. And there's views cross-country evidence saying that family owners manage earnings. And because family owners manage earnings, the earnings are less informative. And this happens in countries with weak laws that protect shareholders. The, uh, the counter argument is stock returns are less informative because when a family owns a large fraction of the stock, there's less free float, which means there's less liquidity. The stock is not traded as much. And because the stock is not traded as much, or they may have dual class shares, that the stock price is not as informative of firm performance, okay? Then their family has legacy incentives. The legacy incentive is essentially a desire to 
maintain intergenerational control of a firm within the family, okay? If their incentive is to maintain this legacy, it will affect their investment horizon. So they are less likely to care about short-term performance, let's say earnings. Uh, if there's less legacy incentive and you have a family owner who wants to liquidate and sell out, then they may be more short-term. And then they would emphasize sh short-term performance at the expense of long-term performance, okay? So there are both these effects, strong legacy incentive. We want to pass the firm on to our progeny. Uh, don't care about liquidating our stake. So we have long horizon. We don't care about current market performance. You have weak incentives. You're not concerned with succession. You want to actually develop a company, sell out and leave and start a new company. Short term, emphasize market performance. Okay. So why CEO turnover performance sensitivity? So the monitoring hypothesis says that a family is a better monitor because they have a concentrated share. So their personal wealth is more related to firm performance. So they really care about how the executive does. The collusion hypothesis is maybe the manager and the family are colluding to defraud minority shareholders because there's no market for corporate control that disciplines them, right? So it's a two-sided hypothesis. And it, what we do is we examine this in family firms, in family firms with more than 50% of family ownership, controlling ownership, in founder firms, and among family and non-family firms. Okay, we also look at family CEO and professional CEOs. So whether the CEO is also a member of the founding family or they've hired an external professional CEO. Okay, our data is very interesting. So when we do research on family firms, it's important to kind of get data where we have lots of variation in family firms, right? So we go to Italy because in Italy, family firms dominate the private sector. We have long time series, you know, from 98 to 2017. So 20 years of data, but the good thing is we can measure legacy intense incentives really, really well in Italy. Because in Italy, they keep detailed data on the family firm structure. Uh, we can identify who the ultimate family owner is. We can find out who their children are, whether they are male or female. Uh, we also have information about the past generation up to the firm's founder. So we can, for every family firm, we can reconstruct the entire history of the family's ownership of that firm. Uh, there's also a huge variation in family ownership. Um, so what we do is we use uh, data from Italy, um, which is why I have an Italian co-author because I don't speak Italian and I can't read Italian. So he did all the heavy work on collecting this data. CONSORB is Italy's version of the SEC. They have data on uh, ownership. We also have the stock exchange yearbook, which gives us uh, detailed data on the family. Um, and then of course, Factiva and data stream, most people are familiar with. So what does this data look like? We, you know, we have data on, so for instance, this is um, Luxottica, uh, famous um, company. And if you look, we have, we know the identities of each person. So Del Vecchio, Leonardo Del Vecchio is the president. Luigi, Luigi Francaville, is vice president. And so we can reconstruct all this. We get 510 CEO turnovers in our data. Then we collect ownership structure for family firms. So for instance, this is where for Luxottica, I know exactly how much Leonardo Del Vecchio owns out of the total outstanding controlling stock. I can identify who all the beneficial owners are. In this case, even Deutsche Bank, uh, Giorgio Armani, um, and so I can, we are able to construct very detailed information on the ownership of the firm. Uh, so from Factiva and Google, we collect whether uh, the family uh, CEO, uh, the CEO is a family member, um, the generation of the con current family owner, whether it's a founder, whether it's second generation, third generation, we can figure out the gender of their children, and primary, because we want to understand 
lineage and one indicator of uh, legacy incentives is there's a literature on something called primogenitor that is um, in many societies uh, having a son increases the incentives to maintain control over firm and having a daughter apparently does not so we collect data on that um, and again we look at accounting performance roa and market performance stock returns okay so what do we find so in family firms and non-family firms, this is the first thing. Is our family firms different? Yes, they are. In family firms, turnover is only sensitive to accounting performance, not to market performance. So this is contrary to the collusion hypothesis, which says that earnings will not be informative. We find earnings are what are emphasized in turnover decisions. But in non-family firms, stock returns are additionally informative of turnover. This is consistent with the free float idea. Ownership concentration may reduces liquidity in the stock. A reduction in liquidity in the stock leads to returns being less informative for family firms and not as good as measures of performance for a CEO. Consequently, family firms will emphasize accounting performance. What does this look like? This is the effect size. Again, like I said, every time I use Bayes rule, I like to see monotonicity because it kind of gives me confidence that this is actually an informational economic story rather than just an artifact of the data. And so if you see the red line is the sensitivity of turnover to returns, it is low, but still significant in the first quartile of family ownership. But if you look at ROA, as ownership concentration increases, the emphasis on ROA increases a lot. Remember, negative is more in the turnover literature. And this effect is monotonic. Okay? So it clearly is that ownership concentration by families affects the incentives to monitor and the measure they use to evaluate the performance of their CEO. <clears throat> then we we'll examine whether it's the noise in the measure that affects whether or not a, noise, uh, a measure is used. And sure enough, when ROA has high variance, ROA is not used by non-family firms. We do not find anything for family firms. So in some sense, it doesn't matter what, how noisy the performance measure is family firms have to use ROA or accounting because that's the only measure of performance they have for a CEO. Okay. okay, then let's get to legacy incentives. Does it matter whether it's a first generation, that means it's a founder, or if it's a second generation, that is the firm was passed on to the children of the CEO? It does not matter. We find no generational effect. It is the coefficient on ROA in a turnover regression, low jet regression is exactly the same as for first generation ownership and subsequent generation ownership. Uh, does it matter whether the family owner has a son? No, we don't find any effect. Uh, so there's no legacy incentive going on. They seem to be monitoring just the same whether they have a son or they don't have a son. So in conclusion, what we find is, we find accounting performance is more salient than market performance in family firms. The evidence is consistent with a lower liquidity in the stock caused by low free float because of ownership concentration, because we find a monotonic decline as ownership concentration increases. Uh, we find no evidence that family firms have any legacy incentives which affect their governance at all. So we conclude that evidence seems consistent with families being active monitors, just as non-family firms have boards of directors, which are active monitors. So there's no uh, difference, okay? So what's the upshot of this exercise? I discussed these two working papers with one simple framework, which invokes Bayes' rule. Um, and this is sort of my, uh, soapbox in the sense that I, I like 
models. Uh, even though the models may be wrong, but they can be useful. And a very simple parsimonious model, like say Bayes rule, uh, has incredible power to explain empirical phenomena, in this case, executive turnover. So we, you know, we find evidence that explains things like CEO succession. We have evidence that actually speaks to whether family ownership affects governance quality and ownership structure affects governance quality. So, so a myriad of settings can explain, be explained by uh, a very simple rule. Finally, and this is my personal plea, is I find empirical work, which is grounded in theory, to be more credible rather than empirical work, which is driven by data availability. And so having an internally consistent framework, which explains how people revise their beliefs in light of new information, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be very mathematical, but it tells us a lot about how the world works. And so that's all I had. I'll open it up to questions again. Uh, thank you very much, dear uh, Professor uh, DJ uh, Nanda, for your contribution and uh, your effort. It's really an excellent presentation. Now, if, any, uh, if anyone have any question, uh, you can open your mic and ask your question. If anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and ask your question. Uh, Dr. Muhammad, have any questions? I think I'm good, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, anyone? No, and if something comes up, please don't hesitate to reach out. You know, we can communicate by email or Zoom. So all feedback is welcome. These are early working papers. And so I would appreciate hearing from any ideas that people may have. Yeah, are there any other questions? If anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and ask your question. Professor Nanda, it was a great uh, presentation. We thank you for uh, sharing with us this interesting, these interesting studies. So uh, oh, thanks very much. Thank you, Mohammed, for your words. Appreciate the opportunity. Always great to share ideas and research with others who are interested. So. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mohammed. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. And thank you, everyone, Jen, that joined us. And I hope to see you soon in Egypt, dear Prof. Yeah, I would love to. You are very, very welcome. It's a dream trip. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye.